Okay, this week's uh, parsha, portion of Korach. The incident of Korach, where he attempted to usurp the authority of Moshe, it wasn't just a question of leadership. The basis for for the mutiny against Moshe to usurp his authority was that the word of Moshe is not the word of God. We had learned about the giving of the Torah at Sinai. At Sinai, every Jew who was present prophesied in a wake state. Every other prophet until that moment and after that moment, other than Moshe Rabbeinu, prophesied only in a sleep state, not in a wake state. Moshe Rabbeinu was in a wake state. Why? Why was Moshe Rabbeinu, why was he able to, why did he have the capacity and the ordinary Jew did not have? No Jew, including Aaron. Aaron and Miriam, Moshe's brother and sister, did not have the capacity. But Moshe had the capacity. And at Sinai, every Jew had the capacity to prophesize in the wake state. The body itself is finite. It's material. It, it's innately not holy. When we live a life of spirituality, your mind engages in Torah study, in belief of God, in the fundamentals, the 13 tenets of Judaism. All that is spiritualization of the mind. The emotion is touched by that. It's spiritualization of, of the motion. We do a mitzvah. You say Kriyashma. You're spiritualizing your mouth. When your mouth articulates those words, your physicality becomes spiritualized, becomes, has takes on a semi-consecrated status. When we believe in God, it's something in the heart. We love God. We observe all 248 positive commandments, which, ev which correlates to every component of the Elon Neshama. As Rav Chaim Vital writes, just as we have 248 parts to the human body, the 48, 248 components in the Jewish soul, every positive commandment corresponds to one component of that Neshama, that soul. It infuses it with a level of spirituality that spiritualizes the soul. But as much as we're spiritualized, as perfect as we may be, you could be Aaron Akoin, you could be Shmuel Novi. These were, you could be the patriarchs, Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. Yaakov being the most special of all three patriarchs. He cannot prophesy in a wake state, only in a sleep state. Why? Because if he would prophesize in the wake state, the limitation of his body would not be able to tolerate to be connected to an unlimited being, an infinite being known as God. The communication would have actually, he couldn't be able to tolerate that level of connection. Because as great as he is, the most special of the patriarchs, but he's really, he has limitation. He's finite. When the infinite connects to the finite, the finite totally is vaporized. Therefore, every prophet, the prophecy is only when he's in a sleep state, and the prophecy is through the soul. It's not through the human faculty. It's not through the brain. And that's why it's cited that uh, something a prophet receives through prophecy, he's able, we're able to communicate information that it would normally take another person 100 years to accumulate. Why? Because the soul is but not bound by time. The soul is a spiritual entity. As a result of that, there it's like it has an unlimited capacity. So you're able, God commun can communicate knowledge or understanding of a hundred years worth of accumulation of knowledge in literally a moment, in a nanosecond. If a person would prophesize in through his faculty, the brain 
the brain has limitation. We speak about IQ, intelligent quotient. Everybody has a capacity. Einstein, whoever you want to say is. Aristotle, still limited. It goes to the soul, it's unlimited. Besides, if you're in a wake state, that means the physicality has to be connected to that communication. The physicality of a human being cannot tolerate it. The person would die. Moshe Rabbeinu, on the other hand, was spiritualized to such a level that his soul and his body were integrated. As a result of that, his soul and body, his body had, even though physically you saw it, it had parameters, it had a form, but what the innate value of that form had an infinite status, unlimited status. The if a God was able to prophesy, communicate to him even in a wake state, which is not the case by any other prophet. Okay? And this is, the Rambam writes this in the laws of the fundamentals of Torah. At Sinai, every Jew prophesies in the wake state. But how? Why? So the Sepharno, who's one of the commentators in the Torah, explains that the Jewish people witnessed Moshe Rabbeinu being the recipient of God's dictates. As Ramam says, the Jews heard God say to Moshe, go tell them such and such. Meaning he was openly chosen to be God's spokesman by God. And they witnessed this. Once God chooses you to be a spokesman, even later communications, if Moshe says something and he says, it's the name of God, it's the name of God. We didn't see it. We didn't witness it. It doesn't make a difference. If you recognize who God is and God openly chose Moshe to be a spokesman, the later communications which come through Moshe, Benu, is not hearsay. That's irrefutable proof that his words are what? Are the words of Hashem, are God's words. Because God already gave him that initial credibility by speaking to him openly and telling them, go tell him such and such. But Moshe Rabbeinu's physicality had an unlimited capacity. Therefore, Moshe could prophesy in a wake state, which the Jews cannot. So why did Jews prophesy in a wake state at Sinai? Because otherwise, unless they experienced it firsthand, that reality, they would re reject it. They would say, it's impossible. How could Moshe prophesy in the wake state? It's an impossibility. So God elevated them and gave them the capacity then for the sake of Moshe Rabbeinu to establish the authenticity of Torah and the authenticity of Moshe, that he is God's spokesman. Therefore, he elevated them to a level that although they were not at that level, to be able to tolerate the communication even in a wake state. But if a person physicality is connecting to God, what happened three days before Sinai? God says to Moshe, tell Jewish people they must separate from the wives. Men and women, they cannot be, they cannot live as man and wife. Why? Because the act of procreation brings contaminates the physicality of the person. It causes a contamination. And if God is going to be communicating them, if it's the soul, it's not a problem. But the communication of Sinai is an awake state. That means the body has to be pure. So if you separate three days before, and of course they immerse themselves in a wellspring, the previous contamination has no realms to them, and there's no basis for an ongoing contamination. Because they have to be in a position to be able to receive the communication in a pure state. But this was all for the sake that they, to give credibility to Moshe, that Moshe is, the, is God's spokesman. Okay? Moshe Rabbeinu, after he came down with the second tablets, what does it say? Or even before he radiated, he radiated holiness. He had rays of light coming out of his face. His body was so spiritual, so spiritualized that it was opaque, that the dimension, intensity of, of his soul pierced his body. The body could not contain that radiance because even the body was spiritualized, so therefore it was opaque. 
in terms of the rays of holiness shown through through his physicality. Barashiva always used to mention the Kuzari. The Kuzari was written by Shlomo Levi that he writes that even the Amoritz, Amoritz is like an ignoramus, person that is not a learned person, who saw a prophet, just saw a prophet, we cannot fathom who that person is. The ignoramus. He was, if he saw what a prophet looked like, even a prophet didn't prophesy in the wake state, but nevertheless, because he did receive that communication, he's a different dimension of human being. And if you would ever meet that kind of human being, you become a different human being yourself. And he writes, we have no inkling of even what the Amoritz was, this ignoramus who saw what, what the prophet was, we can't even fathom who he is, what his capacity is. Mahavdu, who was known, you know, Bernard Baruch, who lived in the uh, in, in the 20s, the early part of the 20th century, was known as a real estate mogul. He was a Sephardic Jew. Sephardic Jew. And he was a financial genius. And what his net worth was a fortune. He was one of the richest people in the United States. Maybe in the world, I'm not sure. I don't think he had the renown of the Rothschilds, but he was very, very wealthy. And he had a, a limousine and he had a chauffeur who would drive the limousine. And in those days, you know, there's maybe a curtain separating where the chauffeur drove and Baruch sat in the back seat. And very often he would travel with people and he would stop. He was a tremendous investor in the stock market. And he knew exactly when to buy, when to sell. And not on those days, there was no insider trading. So he had all the inside tips. What he should buy, what he should not buy. And the chauffeur used to overhear all these conversations. Chauffeur eventually, he retired early, early retirement. By hearing all these tidbits of information, he became, he knew exactly what to, where to put his money, what not to put his money. He became a very wealthy man. That was one of the benefits of being Baruch's chauffeur. The Amoritz, who just saw the prophet, what the prophet represented, what he radiated. He was a dimension of human being, which he looked different, although he didn't radiate like Moshe Rabbeinu. He had a presence because he was touched by God. That presence, you're exposed to that presence, you become a different person. So you can imagine, Moshe Rabbeinu, having a presence, he radiates. He's been to heaven three times. The first set of tablets, second set of tablets. And God openly speaks to him and communicates, tell them such and such. And the Jewish people are elevated to a level that they prophesize in a wake state to receive the communication. So they should appreciate that it's possible that a human being could survive that level of communication. And after everything said and done, a Korach launches a mutiny against Moshe Reynu to claim that what he's telling us is a bunch of hogwash. He made it up himself. And he goes, brings proofs. It's all nepotism. Chose his, he's the king. He chose his brother as the high priest. His brother's children are their assistants. The Jewish people, it's a family affair. He's capitalizing wherever he could capitalize on us. This generation left Egypt. They saw the 10 plagues. And it came through Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu split the sea on them half. Moshe Rabbeinu wrote about the month, the manna, the miracle food, the clouds of glory, the wellspring of Miriam. He struck the rock and there's water. If everything said and done, Korach somehow believes he has a chance to, and he's convinced, as we'll discuss, that Moshe Rabbeinu is a fraud. He's a fraud. 
And when he's trying to pull the wool over everybody's eyes, I have the clarity and I want to lift the wool off your eyes that you should appreciate what I understand. That his word is not the word of God. And we'll see where it's coming from. Which is all because of his personal conflict of interest. Why he saw it the way he saw it. And it was ego. It was his envy and ego. that was totally consuming him and drove him to embrace and absorb this falsehood. But you can't deny reality. The reality is he's a holy man, Moshe. He radiates. He's perfect. Korach says, I'm not sure where he's coming from. He may look that way. He may this that way. Who knows? We read it in Pirkei Ovos, contrasting the students of Rome to the students of Bilam in terms of what their characteristic traits were. Who are Talmidi Avram, the students of Avram, humble, satisfied, low spirited, students of Bilam, un- insatiable need for material, pompous, arrogant. That's the difference between the students of Avram and the students of Bilam, who's the prophet of the nations, who wanted to curse the Jews and destroy them. So there's a question which is asked. Why are we discerning between Avram and Bilam by discussing the difference in their students? Let's let's talk about the difference between Avram and Bilam. Bilam su- suffered from megalomania. He was so consumed with his honor and his glory, he felt he was more deserving than Bolak, the king of Moab. As much money he offered him was never enough because he believed he should be the king. Not a commoner. Bilam, he was very aware what went on Sinai. Avram Avinu is the epitome of holiness. Angels visited his home like they were regular residents. That's how holy his home was. So let's dis- make the dis- let's talk about Avram and Bilam. Why talk about the students of Avram and the students of Bilam? So the answer that it's given is this: If you look at Bilam who was a prophet, he was an evil man, what would you see? You'd see a man radiating holiness. You think he's a holy man. He's wearing the frock. He's wearing that black hat. He has the beard. And he looks like Moshe off the mountain. That's what he looks like. Factually, he's a prophet. And he he has a semblance of prophet, a semblance of Moshe Rabbein. So if we talk about Bilam, they say, what are you talking about? The man is the epitome of, of purity and holiness. You know, you, you know how you know the difference. Look at what they produced. Look what Avram produced. What Avram mentored, look what he mentored. What you mentor, that's an expression of who you are. Bilam mentored monsters. Avram mentored angels. You look at him, you don't see the monster in sheep's clothing. Or in this holy image and profile. When you see the students, then you understand what it is. You plant the sapling and it's going to be fruit bearing until the fruit comes out of that tree. You don't know what kind of fruit you're going to have. And you have two saplings. They look the same. Both fruit bearing. One, One produces one kind of fruit. The other produces another kind of fruit. Then you know which which each one was. Was it poisonous or was it something which is beneficial? That's the difference. That's Bilam versus Avram. Moshe, he really it's holiness. He's this, he's that. Bilam says, but I have proof. Of course, it was based on his convoluted, distorted reality because of his own ego. I could put it in a context to show you Moshe is not Moshe. And I'll prove it to you.
the Rambam writes that anybody whose credibility is based on miracles ain't believable of Adolfi. It's a fickle basis to establish that person's credibility. Why? Because people could always say, you know, every, we have many skeptics. You know why he he appeared to that way? You know why he processed it that way? Because he was in sorcery at the most advanced level. And he convinced you that it's God, but it was really sorcery. It has nothing to do with God. Therefore, the Jews themselves had to see God openly speaking to Moshe to establish him as his prophet, as his spokesman. That that he split the sea, that that he brought the 10 plagues on Egypt, that that he split the rock, Rambam says that's not a proof. That's not sufficient. Because a person could always, old, at one time, say, we were all misled. It's not what you think it is. Miracles could always be interpreted differently. But there's no other explanation. Do you really know? Maybe there is another explanation. There was an article written after the Six-Day War, and it was in the Reader's Digest. It was written by a person by the name of Macintosh. The war was miraculous. Six days, they destroyed all the air forces of the enemy. You saw pictures of prisoners of war walking for miles. They destroyed all their ammunition. Every Tank was a direct hit. It was miraculous. So this non-Jew writes, he says, you know, since the Jews left Egypt, it's been, it's been 3,000 years. And it says in the Jewish Bible, there were plagues. The Nile turned to blood. There were locusts. There was this, there was that. And that was known as revealed miracles. But now, 3,000 years later, going back, being more sophisticated, more scientific, having greater knowledge of biology, we know that there's a certain algae that's a red algae that's a turn to Nile red. The frogs, the infestation of frogs was this. And he had an interpretation of everything. And he says, the way we see today, then they deluded the world. They called it miracles. But we know it wasn't miracles. We know it wasn't miracles. Today, the reality is it's not a miracle, the Six-Day War. It's, but it's unheard of. But don't you realize the sophistication of the Israeli Air Force? It's one of a kind. That's why they succeeded. And it was a surprise attack. They didn't realize. So with all those variables, there's no miracle. This is human prowess. Human sophistication, that's what able to win the war. It has nothing to do with God. But he says, in a few hundred years from now, looking back, you're going to read the facts of the Six-Day War. What do you think they're going to say? It was a miracle. But we know it wasn't a miracle. As initially, the plagues and everything that took place in Egypt was not a miracle. Moshe Rabbeinu, he's radiating. He's not the first and last person to radiate. I'm not saying he has he has a semblance of that. Bill also radiated. Lahabdil. But yet Korach went for the jugular vein. He went to destroy Moshe Rabbeinu. Because he felt that there were many things he did which were inappropriate and not equitable and unfair. And it's contrary to what the Torah says. Where did it all start? Moshe Rabbeinu, his classification, his position was called he was the king of Israel. Who was the king? His brother, Aaron, was the high priest. Now, the Jewish law is of inheritance that a firstborn receives two portions. The one who opens the womb of a mother receives two portions. Who is the father of Moshe and Aaron? Amram. Amram was the Bukhar, was the firstborn of his father. Therefore, his children, when they inherit the pedigree 
through the pedigree, they inherit certain positions of power. Moshe being the great, he had, he's, he's the king. Aaron being the son of Amram, he receives another portion. What's the second portion? The priesthood. That's, that's the second portion. Now there's a third position to be given out. The prophet, the prince of the tribe of Levi. Who does that go to? Korach was the son of the next brother. So if you go according to the line of order, sequential order of birth, Korach should have received the third appointment. And has not do greater or less great. It's inheritance. As a result of that, Korach felt he deserves to be chosen to be the prince of the tribe of Levi. Who did Moshe choose? Elitzofen ben Uziel. Elitzofen, son of Uziel, was the son of the youngest brother. There were four brothers, the youngest. So Korach said, I got a problem with Moshe Rabbeinu. If you would choose positions based on qualification, ability, I should have been the king. I should have been the high priest. It's based on inheritance. It's around what, what should have been. Everything goes according to the laws of inheritance. Moshe receives the first. Aaron receives the second. But if it's inheritance, I should receive the third. Why was I left out? If it's based on qualification, I'm even more qualified than Moshe. I should be the king. Or middle, I should be the high priest. Therefore, the whole thing is a sham. He's deluding us. He's trying to mislead us. So Korach is coming from, he felt he was left out. In truth, he should be the king. Even that he was envious of. Or the high priest. But I got to make do with it. Because God said that's the way it has to be. But what about the third point in Chip? I always ask. You have a person whose parents raised him selflessly, materially, emotionally. They literally mentored him every part of his life. And everything he has is due to his parents, the way they raised him. And then you have a third party who didn't do one ten thousandth of what the parent did for, the, for their son. And he has a tremendous level of beholdenness to that third party. Although it's one ten thousandth of what the parents did. Father calls his son, two in the morning. Son, could you come over? Could it wait till tomorrow? That's what the son says to his father. Could it wait till tomorrow? He says, it could, but I'd like to speak to you now. Could you please come on? Come on over. He comes over. He feels his, his feathers have been ruffled. His father put him in an uncomfortable position. He had no choice but to say, I'm coming. This third party, who was good to him and giving to him, which is only one thousandth of what his parents did, if he would call in the middle of the night, two in the morning, and say, I'd like to see you now, there'd be no resistance, no hesitancy. He wouldn't think, you can't call me some other time. You're calling me now, now's the time. But your parent, who did endlessly more, dad, mom, can't wait till tomorrow. Why? The son will not deny the fact that this third party cannot hold up a candle to, to the parents. Nevertheless, in terms of a sense of beholdenness and willingness to do the stranger, he's more willing than the parent. Why? So I said, this is the difference. What's the essence of a person? The essence of a person is his ego. This person, who's not related to the beneficiary, he chooses him to accommodate him at a very special level. Financial opportunities, personal level, social opportunities, which this person doesn't offer to others. So the person asks himself a question. Why did this person choose me? Why did he take a liking to me and not to others? Do do the same for others. It must be he sees something unique in me. 
There's something in me unique, and because I'm unique, therefore he's doing all this for me. So why is he doing for me? Because he sees me special. When a parent does for a child, it's not because they see something special in their child. You're my child, you need no other reason. So it has nothing to do with him personally, because you have some kind of unique capacity or capability. That's why the parent does for the child. If you address the ego of a person, you've given him his life. You give him everything. The parent doesn't address the ego. The parent provides because you're my son. You're my son. The father says you're my son. The mother says you're my son. As a result of that, it not, has nothing to do with me per se, but it's me being your child. When a stranger goes and does for a third party, why is he doing for a third party? Other than he's something unique in the person. That's about him. When it's about him, then you take off. Okay? That's the difference between the two of them. The ego is the essence. You address a person's ego, you bought them. You have them. It has nothing to do with how much I do or how much I don't do. But what did I address when I interacted with you? People, we speak about false flattery. What are people? Sometimes you hear false, false flattery. You feel sick. It's so lack of, of genuineness that a person says who that person may be. But you have people, they can sit, they bask in their glory. They know three quarters of what's being said is not even true. But at least a quarter is true, maybe. And they take it all in because that's the ego. And people delude themselves because people don't listen that well when they are praised them and whatever it is and heaped all kinds of special opportunities. Korach, he was a very wealthy man. He was the wealthiest common who ever lived in the history of the world as a Jew. He's a man who had one of a kind of pedigree, the same pedigree as Moshe. He had a presence, handsome, and he had tremendous wisdom. A man like himself, and he was not humble. Having all those qualities, not being humble, what do you have? You have seen the balloons that float in Macy's parade. That's how inflated it is. That's how inflated his ego was. And all of a sudden, Moshe Rabbein is giving out positions of honor and status. He skipped over. The word of deflating his balloon or his bubble was burst. It's, not, it's a lot worse than that. He took his life because his life is his honor. His life is his ego. And if you don't stroke that ego, and just to the contrary, I feel embarrassed that you didn't give it to me, you've caused me devastation. You've killed me. Therefore, he had out for Moshe Rabbeinu. He was going to usurp his authority in a way, whatever it took, he was going to undermine, undermine Moshe Rabbeinu. He said, this is the reason, that's the reason. It had nothing with those, there was only one reason. The one reason was it was envy. He was envy of Moshe, and he added in for Moshe. Because Moshe should have provided what he should have provided for him. But the question is, at Sinai, Hashem said, After Sinai, it will be so irrefutable, they will believe in you and forever. Korach was at Sinai. His community who was swallowed up by the earth, they were all at Sinai. And yet they're all smoking what he's smoking, so to say. How did they see it so wrong? And at the end of the day, Moshe says, you can take fire pants with incense. 251 of you, only one's going to survive. The one who God chose to be the high priest of why is the rest, the rest of the people are going to be burnt. And they went for it. Who's going to take such odds? 50, 251 to 1 that you're, going to, that you're going to survive this. Person doesn't have a chance. 
but they did. Because somehow Korach numbed them with his wealth and with his arguments that people, after a while, they start denying reality. There was a case many years ago. There was a person who was a granddaughter of the Nuas publisher family. Candy Nast. And she became a Balas Chuba, the granddaughter. And when he passed away, her grandfather, it was a second marriage. And every day for as many years, for 40 years, 50 years, the show would pick her up at the at her home and they go eat in a certain restaurant in Manhattan, some very exclusive restaurant. Every day. When they were in New York, every day, that was the routine. Lunch. He would go from his office, pick her up, they go to this exclusive restaurant. He passed away. His wife said, he never had children from her. His wife said, uh, and it was after the funeral. She was at the funeral. Graveside ceremony. He was put in the ground. The wife calls up the, sh the chauffeur and says, uh, when is my husband coming with the, uh, you know, when are we going out to eat in the restaurant? And we're not told the woman was senile. She was not senile at the time. But because that was so fixed in place as part of her lifestyle, 50 years every day, she went to this exclusive restaurant with, with her husband. Don't you realize he's not here any longer? Life has changed. For her, she wanted life to continue as it was before. When you're in that mode of thinking, you don't think about he's not here any longer. I mean, that's an extreme example. Steve radiates, but I have foolproof evidence that he's a fraud. Whatever it was, but it all was based on his ego. That's how, that's how wrong he was. But Moshe was still at Sinai. God spoke to him. It's true, he spoke to him. If the sun is shining brightly and I take a blindfold, which light cannot penetrate it. I cover my eyes. Does that mean to say the light, the sun is not shining? It's shining. And you feel the heat coming through that material. We'll say, you know, it's like it has an electric warmer in it. It's not the sun. Look, you can say whatever you want, but it's total self-delusion. That's, that's what it was. Meaning there's enough evidence at Sinai that if you want to see it objectively, it's impossible to refute it. It's fact. Korah, due to his conflict of interest, he says, I can't accept it. I reject it. And therefore, whatever has to happen is going to happen. The Moshe Rabbeinu gave them, he says, the proof of fire will be through the fire pans and the incense. And he says, whoever is the high priest will not die. All the rest are going to be burnt to death. Korach went for it. Korach was not a fool. So why did he go for it? So Rashi brings the Midrash. Eino hitoso. His eye misled him. What was his eye misled him? Because he saw through divine vision that he was going to have a grandson by the name of Samuel the prophet, Shmuel Anovi, who status-wise was the clue of the Moshe and Aaron. That's how special he was. And he was his grandson. A number of generations later, so he thinks to himself, if I'm going to be the one to die, and my family is, is we're all going to die, how could I have a grandson, Shmuel Anovi, Samuel the prophet? Evidently, I'm going to survive. That confirms that I'm in the right, that my suspicions of Moshe are confirmed, that he misled us. It's not God's word, it's his word. It's interesting. But you know, firstly, at this point, was he deserving to have a divine vision to see that his grandson is going to be Shmuel, Samuel the prophet? He's coming here to topple Judaism. To say Moshe's Judaism is not the, is not the, is not the word of God. 
And God gives him this glimpse of who his descendants could be. And this misled him. Because what was the end of the story? Korach and his community were swallowed up to confirm forever Moshe Emes, the Torah, so Emes. Moshe is truthful and his Torah is truthful. The Torah is, his, is the word of Hashem. That we find that after we left Egypt, all the deities of Egypt were destroyed except one more in the desert. Baal the Lord of the North. That was the only one he didn't destroy. And we traveled, he says, to travel back towards the enemy. Because I want to mislead power. Let him think and believe that you're trapped in the desert. Why? Because the deity of that location was the Lord of the North. But what was that? That he was only bathing him. God didn't destroy him to mislead him, to draw him into the desert, to go into the, in, into the Red Sea, to be destroyed. God gave Korach this glimpse of the future, although he wasn't worthy, exactly to confirm that his suspicions are correct, that he will be the lone survivor. Little did he know that Shmuel Hanavi, who's his grandson, was a descendant of his children who the last moment did Shuba. And because they pulled out the last moment, this is their descendant. So God gave him this piece of information to confirm in his mind that Moshe Rabbeinu is a fraud. Because otherwise, why am I surviving? Evidently, I'm right. That's all to mislead you. You're surviving because your grandchildren, the tshuva, they repented. But he says, it's impossible. Could they repent? We're all in this together. But he misread it. Therefore, in his mind, if his grandson is Shmuel, that means his children are also going to survive. And he's going to survive. But that was only ultimately to destroy him. And what was the value of that? To confirm and put to rest forever Moshe and the Torah send this. Moshe is truthful and the Torah is truthful. That's, that's the end of the story. Many things on the way, which we discussed today, it's not enough time, but that's, that's where we're going to stop.